Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're starting to stream in. It's still pretty rowdy out there. But uh, welcome to Grace Bible Church. Uh, in your seat back is a great connect, Grace Connection card. Please fill that out with prayer requests. And uh, if you're visiting with us, let us know who you are. Give us some information so we can uh, contact you. The Faith Life app is, is on, and uh, that uh, there's some upcoming events coming at the church, and uh, if you get the notifications, you can see that there's quite a few things coming with the fall um, uh, IFCA conference and such, and we will uh, we'll be looking at those in just a second. Ladies, there will be a new seven-session dinner and Bible study meeting every other week for the fall. The study is called Take Courage, and it begins on Tuesday, September 21st, and uh, roll video. Hi, I'm Jennifer Rothschild. I hope you'll join me for this seven-session study on the book of Haggai. It's called Take Courage. We need to take courage in this life, but sometimes we don't have it. Even when you are walking with courage and you find yourself discouraged, you remember the genesis, the source of your courage is that God created you. It's an invitation from God to come. Take courage because I have courage that I want to grant you. This study will challenge you to rebuild what is broken and to rise to be the woman that God called you to be. All right, there's information flyers on your seats. I understand for that one. And uh, you fill that out if you're interested. Seeing as it is a dinner, they'll need to have some idea about numbers and that kind of thing. If you'd like the office to order your book, you need to get that done uh, within the next two weeks by September 5th, and please give that to Rhonda. All right, now we have a new video update from Pastor Ryan King. Hello, Grace Bible Church. My name is Ryan King and I am your church planner for the Colorado Springs Monument area. Uh, it's a pleasure to get to give you guys an update. I'm thankful for Pastor Jed and his help there. And I just wanna give you a quick rundown on what's been going on at Peak Bible Church here in Colorado Springs. Uh, we are currently kind of central east side of Colorado Springs. We've been there for two months now. God is blessed and he's provided well for those two months, but we're hoping to be able to move to that monument uh, Black Forest area, somewhere on that northern side of the spring soon, because that's where a lot of growth is happening, and we're seeing God develop and grow the city, and we want to be part of that. But some of the stuff that's going on right now, we've been preaching through the book of John. It's been a lot of fun. When we started the church, we really want to make sure that we're getting the gospel right. That's the, the primary concern there, is that we're preaching the gospel effectively and according to scripture. So we're through the first four chapters of John on to chapter five this week. Uh, it's been a fun time. We really enjoyed it. God's been blessing. We have 38 covenant members already with 10 more in a membership class right now. Uh, he, God has just brought these people in and, and you know, maybe all 10 from the membership class don't join, but there's some folks that are excited to be there, have already told us they intend to. Uh, we're, we're really happy about what's going on there. And we're doing some, some kind of fine tuning in the building. We've got some guys coming over today to help me move some stuff around. Uh, we don't have a lot of classrooms, a lot of space, but we're starting a young adult slash youth group kind of class. That's happening uh, beginning this Sunday, so I have to find a different room for my membership class. We're gonna clear out a storage room, make some space there. But it's a really good problem to have that we're already kind of running out of room. Some upcoming events we have going on. Uh, Friday, August 20th, we have our first family night. This is where members gather. We share a meal together, spend some good time uh, talking about the church, where it's going, what this vision looks like, what our leadership's doing. Uh, we're, we're thrilled. Um, and then uh, coming up on September 8th, we have small groups. Uh, this is an integral part to our church. It's uh, incredibly important for us to be accountable one to one another. That's what we, we qualify for membership in four different ways. We want people to be there in service. We want them to, to serve faithfully. We want them to give faithfully. We want them to be part of our accountability structure in the church, uh, one another in coming alongside, 
uh, that the strength can bear, or that the strong can bear with the burdens of the weak, like Paul tells us in Galatians 6. Um, so uh, that starts up September 8th, and that's that main mechanism we'll use to promote that accountability and unity within the church. And then I'm really excited for the IFCA Regional coming up September 20th and 21st. I get to be with you guys there in Parachute. I'm absolutely thrilled to be there. Uh, I'm looking forward to that greatly. I'm hoping that my my wife, uh, Amanda, and uh, can come. Uh, that depends on if grandma can watch the kids or not, but uh, we're, we're looking forward to being there. Um, three quick prayer requests I'll give you. One is I need an elder board. We're falling under the elder board of Mesa Hills Bible Church, our, our mother church currently, and we're thankful for the men there and what they're doing. Uh, but coming up in June of 22, we want to establish our own elder board, and we'll begin training some men for that uh, early September. So uh, we've got some men that have been around for a long time that are good godly men, but we want to make sure we're all on the same page. So please pray for us as we assemble an elder board. Uh, the second is that we really do need a new location. We want to be in towards that monument area. Uh, we want to be up north there. And it, real estate, as you know, in Colorado is ridiculously expensive. Uh, so we're waiting for God to provide. And he does own the cattle on a thousand hills. He'll provide whatever he wants. And uh, he is a good God and he cares for us. And if we are supposed to end up on the east side of the Springs and uh, east central, praise God, we'll do that. Um, but we really think this is a direction that we need to head. So we're praying for God to provide a location. And the final thing is a very personal one, is I need a home for my family. We currently live in a parsonage here at Mesa Hills Bible Church, just right next to the church. And it's been uh, gracious provision from the church and from God, we're thankful for it. Uh, but we need a place for my family to be long-term. Mesa said we can live in that house for up to three years after we start the church. So we are on a time clock now. And uh, as I said, with the location, housing is expensive here. So um, we're praying for God's provision, praying that he'll uh, provide a great place for me and my family where we can show good hospitality and love on our church and be here for a long time uh, in, a, in a permanent setting. So um, thank you so much for giving me this time. God bless you. A lot of prayer requests, and that's one of the biggest ways that Grace Bible Church can, can really help with that church plant. Uh, is through prayer, and uh, uh, I, I know that Pastor Jed, uh, while attending a conference, was moved uh, to understand uh, to a certain point that there needs to be kind of a shift in church planting and, and really a focus back to the urban areas in this country, which are um, really in need, and uh, if you like to immerse yourself in news, which I do, and and uh, you can you could just see that it hits you square in the face constantly how our urban areas are are walking away from Christ and even some of the the churches within those urban areas are walking away from Christ and they aren't being taught true scripture and and the gospel so please be praying for that church plant also uh, uh, this little church is hosting the IFCA conference coming up on September 20th uh, uh, not too terribly far away, about a month away, and Pastor Ryan and his wife will be here uh, at that conference, so if you'd like to meet with him, uh, you are also invited to that IFCA conference coming up on the 20th, and uh, uh, you can come and watch that. Now, there are also flyers on your seats, and they ex explain how you can show and help us. Oh, this is something we need, seeing as we're hosting we need some help with uh, hospitality at the event um, for working in the kitchen, by preparing some dishes from home, dropping them off, or by doing both. Uh, once you've decided how to serve, please sign up at the Welcome Center. So we do need some, some help with that, with that setup and that hosting of that IFCA conference. Pastor Jed will also be speaking, I believe, on the 20th, uh, the Monday night of that conference. Uh, so we would like to uh, show our support for that, as many people as we can get uh, here that are available. That would be wonderful. All right, as the, uh, are they taking, yep, uh, offering? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity. And Lord, I, I, I ask you to bless that church plant in the monument area. And, um, Lord, they, they have many, many needs. And... Uh, looking for a space to hold a church in this time in this market is uh, is uh, truly a daunting thing and Lord uh, something that we know is not beyond you in any which way but Lord what a
testament to your power and glory and, and your desire to reach people in that area would be if you could uh, help them with those, with those needs that they have. And Lord, we ask that you would uh, help us in this service, that you would help us to uh, fully appreciate who you are and, and the love that you have uh, for us and help us to extend in some small way uh, a bit of that love back to you in our worship and in our attention. And Lord, we ask that you would use, help us to use these funds that uh, of the offering for wise purposes, Lord, that they might be used to spread your word. Lord, we love you so much, and we ask that you um, uh, to accept this offering of this worship to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Well, good morning. As we get started this morning, our first song, Everlasting God. I love songs that are bathed in scripture. Uh, it, it just brings those words even more to life as we worship our Lord. And as we think about everlasting God, I want to direct you to Isaiah chapter 40 and verses 28 through 31. <clears throat> the prophet writes, do you not know, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait upon the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Join us, please, and stand, and if you're able, let's sing together, Everlasting God. Our next song, I haven't done for a while, from the inside out. And I came across a, uh, a, an article from a, uh, from a website called Bible Devotions and Inspiration. And I, I really enjoyed what I found here, talking about this song, Inside Out. Let me just read a lyric from the song and then follow it up with a passage of scripture. The song starts out with the, the phrase, a thousand times I've failed 
still your mercy remains. From Lamentations chapter 3, we read this. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The next line of the song says, I, And should I stumble again, still I'm caught in your grace. From Psalm 37, Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Then the song says, Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. From Isaiah 40, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And then in my heart, in my soul, Lord, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. Let's sing together from the inside out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. What a great promise. What a great truth. All right. Our last song this morning, King of My Heart, should be very familiar to you, especially the chorus, um, which has a repeating theme. Uh, we heard Pastor King in a minute ago in his video talk about God's goodness. No matter where that church plant, where, where their final building is, 
God is good, right? And this song, the chorus, repeats that theme. You are good, good, oh, so good. But I want to direct you specifically to verse 2. King of my heart, be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. May it be true that the working of God in our hearts is so strong that when those around us see us, the echo of God rings forth and they see him through us. That is my prayer and I hope it would be yours as well. Let's sing together, King of My Heart. that we can sing about our great God. I love singing about him. Let's pr go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Gracious, gracious Heavenly Father. God, thank you that because of the work of your Son, God, there can be a song upon our heart, praise upon our lips. And God, we, we come this morning to praise you, to glorify you. God, thank you that we can gather together as, as a church family to do that together, to lift you up as your children. God, as we, we come together this morning, we thank you for 
just the, the wonderful report that we hear from, from Pastor Ryan as he is uh, over there in, in Colorado Springs area. Lord, we lift up that church this morning. We ask that you would bolster their faith. God, that you would give them a, a burning passion and desire for, for the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. God, that they would reach their community for, for your son. And uh, God, we just pray that you would protect them, provide for them, Lord. God, they need a, a place. God, and Pastor Ryan and his wife need a home. And God, these things are, are no small matter for you. God, you can, you can handle them. And God, we, we look forward to how we as, as a church can be a part of that whether through our prayers and engaging on our knees or through our gifts and, and helping out, whatever it be, God, please use us. Lord, I pray for the many different things that are starting up this fall. I think of the ladies' Bible study. I think of Awana. I think of uh, just so many things that are uh, starting and just all those that are a part of those ministries Lord, be with the leaders, be with those who are teaching and preparing, give them strength and energy, and Lord, we desire to reach our community for you as well. God, we thank you so much that we have the farmers with us this morning, and uh, we look forward to hearing about how you are working through this family. Uh, Lord, what a blessing that we can be encouraged by them, and in turn, Lord, we ask that we would be a blessing and an encouragement uh, to them as they are here with us fellowshipping. God, we come now to your word. Lord, I pray that you would use me as your vessel to declare your truth. God, prepare our hearts as we listen to what you have for us. And may we leave here today applying it well to our lives. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. For those who haven't done so, please, uh, if you would like, for uh, dismissed to Children's Church up through the third grade. And uh, for the rest of you, I encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis, and we're going to be in the 26th chapter today. Uh, as you turn there, I want to encourage you to stay after uh, for our fellowship time, but also our Sunday school hour. We're going to have the youth uh, joining us as well, and we are going to hear from the farmers, and, and I believe we even get to hear from uh, your kids on some of the stuff that's going on too, aren't we? In a video type format? Awesome. So looking forward to that. Encourage you to, to stay for that time and, and be blessed. As, as you turn there, I, I read through this chapter numerous times as I was preparing, and um, it occurred to me, as we come to the scriptures often, and, and I find myself doing this in conversations, in studies, in discussions, in engagement with others, I, I find that I, I find the negative sometimes. I'm really good at coming to a passage and pointing out, well, that wasn't very godly, or, or looking at an individual's life and going, shame on you. And, and this, this negative approach, finding the faults in those that we're studying and looking at, can be a tendency from time to time. And I don't know if you've ever had that same you know, dilemma. I don't know about you, but it makes me feel better. I look at a passage and I go, well, I haven't done that, you know. Uh, I, I look and go, well, at least I didn't go and kill my best friend for his wife. You know, I'm pretty good. You know, and looking at those different things in Scripture, we compare ourselves, we look at their faults, and we build ourselves up. I mean, think about it, as you've gone through Genesis with me, as we've been going through, I mean, how many of you have gone and told people around you that your wife was your sister? I hope none of you. I mean, really, we look at that and we go, well, I'm a pretty good husband, you know? And, and it makes us feel good, doesn't it? I mean, and, and how many of you, if you're wanting children, go and sleep with another woman and have a baby? I mean, we look at that and we're going, well, I'm doing pretty good. And so on and so forth. We look at those faults and, and we build ourselves up through it. And, and not that we shouldn't see those things, 
But we, we tend to have that attitude even in our day-to-day -day lives, don't we? I mean, think about the things we, we find so thrilling. Gossip. I mean, why is gossip so thrilling? Because we're, we're talking about, we're discussing the negative things about somebody else that makes us feel better about ourselves, right? Or the media. Have you noticed how negative the media is all the time? Why are they that way? Why are they sharing all these horrible things? Because media wants you to look, and we are enticed by it. We're drawn to that. It can even roll over sometimes and trickle over into our parenting. As we, as we raise our, our children, we can see their faults and we address their faults. We discipline their faults, but we fail to see the things that they are doing well and, and praise them. So as we come to this passage today, I, I want to I wanna just caution us to approach it observing the faults that we're going to see in Isaac. Notice those things. But I also want you and I to praise the good that we see. To, to look at it and apply the things that, that we see that are good and praiseworthy demonstrated in Isaac's life and, and apply those things to our life. So as we begin chapter 26, keep that in mind and go easy on Isaac. If, if your life was summarized basically in two chapters of the Bible and it had to record everything, what would be recorded of your life? And would you want a final summation of who you are and the person that you were based off of that? So let's, let's approach today's passage in, in balance. And I want us to look at two things and consider two things as we look at chapter 26. First of all, what is it we need to learn about this passage? Not from it, but about this passage. There's things that we are going to look at and address that help us get a better context of the things that are going on in Genesis, that help us get a better picture of, of what is it that Israel, as they are going into the promised land, reading through Genesis and hearing these words, that they're understanding and why God is doing this and why God is sharing this. So we're going to get a bigger picture and look at what we can learn, but then I want us to look at what we we can apply from this passage. I believe we can always come to Scripture and, and look at Scripture and apply something from it from our lives. There are certain passages that are very difficult to have any application. They're necessary. It's in there. God gave it to us for a reason. In all honesty, there's some chapters I probably will never preach on. Teach and study, yes, but not preach. But today's passage is preach-worthy. So as we look at Genesis chapter 26, I, I want us to remember, Abraham is dead. We, we, are, now, we are now looking at Isaac's life. And in all the promises that, that God gave to Abraham, we are now beginning to look at how they will be fulfilled and, and brought out through Isaac's life. So keep that in mind. As Israel is observing this, they're looking at it and going, whoa, Abraham's no longer on the scene. What about these promises? And that's where we begin in chapter 26, verse 1. Look at what it says. This is a beautiful, beautiful passage. Now, there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine that occurred in the days of Abraham. So we immediately... And Moses is letting the people know this is a different famine. This is a different season of, of uh, a struggle. Not the one in Abraham's day. This is new to Isaac. And it goes on. So Isaac went to Gera, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land which I tell you which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants, I will give all these lands. And I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven 
and will give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants, all nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statute, my laws. We come, verse 6 says, so Isaac lived in Gerah. We see an immediate obedience. Scripture is, is confirming for us that Isaac is the one that this blessing and this promise is being passed on through. We've, we've read where, where God told Abraham Isaac was the son of promise. But here now, I, I mean, imagine being Isaac. And your wife struggled to have children and, and God blessed with, with twins. But now you're wondering, am I really the one that's, that's going to be carrying on this promise? You know, God talked to my dad my, and he told my dad, but is this going to happen? And here God confirms beautifully. We notice there's a famine. And just like his father there's a temptation to run. Remember when Abraham ran to Egypt to escape the, the difficulties, the, the barren times of, of that famine, and he ran to Egypt. In those barren times, it's so tempting for us to run to the world, to run to, to where it looks greener. Oh, and it was greener along that Nile. But God says no. And no doubt Isaac was well aware of the difficulties that came from Abraham going down to Egypt. Remember, Ishmael was his brother and the difficulties that came with it. But Isaac does what God says. Let's praise him for that. Let's look at that and go, wow. Here is a man who is tempted in the midst of difficult times, barren times, drought, famine, and God says, no, stay. I want you, and he uses the word sojourn. I want you to wander around in this land. Now, that may not sound very thrilling, does it? Well, what about Egypt? It's green. It's lush. No, you stay here. And Isaac obeyed. He stayed in Gera. He wandered. He dwelled in the land. Notice here that God says, Isaac, there's not going to be a permanent dwelling place for you here. That could discourage some. Here's the thing, church. Side note. God has told us this is not our permanent dwelling. It isn't. He's going and he's making that dwelling for us. This is just temporary. We're just sojourning in this land. And he says, your descendants, though, those who will come, they will get the land. They will possess the land. What a beautiful thing to, to promise to Isaac, who, who really only has two boys at this time. So Isaac is willing to prepare and, and build for future generations. That is an amazing mindset. I went over to Germany one time for, for my brother's wedding, beautiful wedding. But before the wedding, we went and we toured some of the towns in Germany. And, and one of the places we went to, it'll forever stand out in my mind, was this cathedral. It was massive. We looked up and it just towered above us. We went all the way to the top and there was bells at the top of this thing that were just ginormous. That's a word. All right? It was, it, I, I have no clue how they got those bells up there. And as we were walking back down and, and we were listening to the, the, the guide that was telling us about this cathedral, he told us how many hundreds of years it took to build. And how those that were building the foundation, just the beginning walls, would never even see the roof on the first layer but they built faithfully for the generations to come. I was like, wow, that'll preach. He kind of looked at me weird, but uh, I'm like, what an illustration for the church. 
that we live our lives, we, we equip the next generation with the future generations in mind. And here Isaac is, is promised future generations will possess this land, but you won't. But I want you, Isaac, to prepare those generations. As Israel would read that, they would realize, oh my goodness, we're the generation that's going in to possess the land. What a beautiful thing. And God reestablishes his oath with Isaac. Did you notice here throughout as we read that portion, it's God working, God working, God working. And God reaffirms his oath. There's going to be a multiplication of his descendants. Who's going to do it? God. And then once again, as he promised Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you. What an affirmation there. What a confirmation that Isaac, you are. It is going to come through you, through your descendants. I want you to consider just for a moment a passage, some words that the nation of Israel would have fresh on their hearts and their minds as as they would read these words in Genesis. When God gave the law at, at Mount Sinai, he, he spoke these words in Exodus. Exodus 20, beginning in verse 3, God says this, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall, make, shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is, is in heaven, above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth you shall not worship them or serve them for I the Lord your God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Those words would have been fresh on the people's hearts. As Isaac is looking at the generations to come, as we look at what's going to occur and unfold in this passage, we see that Isaac will duplicate certain mistakes, certain sins that Abraham did. We will also see that Isaac will duplicate the faith that he saw in his father. What a challenge to us as we parent and grandparent, aunt and uncle, the next generation. As we as a church gather around that next generation and raise them up. What a challenge. What a commitment. As we continue to look, we'll see that Isaac responded in both ways. Here's the thing, though. As we pursue, as we go through life, there's things that we can look at with our parents, our grandparents, our past. The truth is, you and I have a choice. When we come to this God, when we come to the God of the scriptures, you and I have a choice as to what we do, as to how we listen and obey. Do not use the past as an excuse. Look at what happens. Beginning in verse 6. So Isaac lived in Gera. Isaac was not without faults. Listen to what's that. When the men of the place asked about his wife, he said, she is my sister. What? Again? All right, don't be too hard on him, okay? Here we go. She is my sister, for he was afraid to say, my wife, thinking the men of the place might kill me on account of Rebekah, for she is beautiful. It came about... When he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looked out through the window and saw, and behold, this is comical. 
Isaac was caressing his wife, Rebecca. All right, now that's just funny, okay? I mean, if you come to the scriptures and you read it to blah, 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 blah. I mean, you got to look at this and just laugh. He goes and tells everybody, this is my sister. And then all of a sudden, the king, you know, Abimelech's looking at him and goes, Wee! you don't do that with your sister. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, certainly she is your wife. How then did you say she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, Because I said I might die on account of her. Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech charged all the people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Not all the lessons that his dad learned did he learn. Sometimes we repeat things, don't we? Or maybe Abraham was just a little too embarrassed about getting a tongue lashing from someone in that land, an ungodly ruler, that he really didn't pass that on to his son. We don't know. But whatever the case is, we see failure here. But notice, Isaac does follow and obey God. Look at verse 12 and 14, and look at what God does. As we go through this, don't look only at Isaac. Look at God. Look at this God you serve, I serve. Look at this. Now Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him, and the man became rich and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy. For he had possessions of flocks and herds and a great household so that the Philistines envied him. Are you seeing what God is doing? The blessing that God is putting. Not only is, is Isaac able to see this blessing, but the people are able to see this. And don't leave here today thinking, if God is blessing me, then I'm going to be wealthy and I'm going to be rich. That is not what you are to learn from this. But God was working, God was establishing in Isaac's life that he would not have to be dependent on the world, but dependent upon God. Because if you stopped right there, you'd be like, wow, that's great, and leave here thinking, I just want God to bless me. Well, here's what happens. When God's blessing comes, so does trouble. Look at the next verses here. I think that's where I'm going. I don't have my glasses, so I apologize. My notes are bouncing all over the place. Forgot those today. Look at what happens when, when God is blessing, when God is working, the world will oppose. Look at what it says now. All the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines stopped up by filling them with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are too powerful for us. And Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gera and settled there. Then Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his fa father Abraham. For the Philistines had stopped them up with the, um, after the death of Abraham. And he gave them same names which his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of flowing water, the herdsmen of Gerah quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac, saying, The water is ours. So he named the well Essek, because they contended with him. Then he dug another well, and they quarreled over it too, and he named it Sitna. Are you seeing a picture here? God is blessing, and there's constant struggle. And you're like, so they filled in a well. 
a well was, was livelihood, it was, it was water, it was source, it was how you, you stayed alive, how your herd stayed alive. It was essential. You didn't go and turn on a faucet, you had to go to the well. But I want you to also notice the absence of Isaac rage and wrong response. When there was a well that was filled in, he moved and went to another place. He, he did not quarrel, he trusted God. Okay, God, you're just moving me on. And he continues to move, he continues to ro rotate, and God affirms that this is where he has him. There will be times of difficulty in our life, but God will affirm when you are following him, he will give his affirmation. And look what God does for Isaac. It says in verse 22, he moved away from there and dug another well. And they did not quarrel over it. You know why? There's no water yet. So he named it Rehoboth. For he said, at last, the Lord has made room for us and we will be fruitful in the land. Then he went up from there to Beersheba. The Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your, your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. He comes to this place and God begins to affirm to him, this is where I want you. And notice that everything is not that everything's going to be peachy kino in the land. There's going to be difficulties. You're still going to have to dig wells, Isaac. But I'm with you. I'm with you. Difficulties are not always indications for you and me that we are not where God wants us. My email has been flooded with, with emails from pastors over in Afghanistan this week. Many of them sending messages, asking for prayer. But amazingly, the prayers that I would probably be praying if I was in their shoes is not the prayers they're asking for. Many of those pastors that are sending emails are saying, what a wonderful thing in the next two weeks, we are probably going to get to see our Savior, Jesus Christ, face to face. And they said, and, and, and there is such a work for the gospel. They are turning away resources to take them out of the country. They're like, no, we have to stay because the message of Jesus Christ is is." stronger and more sought after than ever before. They said, just pray for us that we have a boldness and a courage to bring as many people to Jesus Christ in the next two weeks before we meet him. What a prayer. And those are ones in distress and, and difficult times. What faithfulness. And we see that faithfulness in Isaac through the difficulties he continues to look to God. Did you notice that Isaac, like his father, pitched his tent, built altars? His dwelling is temporary. His worship is permanent. Our dwelling needs to be temporary. Held with an open hand before God. Our worship needs to be something we hold tight. What an example. Our worship is permanent, folks. Our dwelling is temporary. And I don't know about you, but I want to invest in the permanent the things that will outlast this life, the things that are eternal. So Isaac trusts in God. And there's a trust confirmed. I, I love how these verses conclude in this chapter. Then Abimelech came to him from Gera with his advisor, Ahazoth, 
and Fecal. I think that's how you pronounce it. The commander of his army. Isaac said to them, why have you come to me? Since you hate me and have sent me away from you, they said, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. Let me pause there. When people look at your life, when people look at how you respond to adversity, how you respond to blessing, do they see the Lord? Abimelech did, and it scared him. We plainly see that the Lord has been with you. So we said, let there now be an oath between us, even between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do no, us no harm, just as we have not touched you and have done to you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. Are they forgetting about all the wells? This is a bargain here. They're like, hey, listen, God is really blessing you. We're terrified of you. We haven't really done anything yet, and, and we don't want you to hurt us, so let's make a peace treaty here. A little preemptive thing here. You are now the blessed of the Lord. Then he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. I think of Psalm 23 when I read that. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Isn't that a beautiful thing that, that Isaac can do this because of God, even in the presence of really his enemies, those who hate him? He can treat them this way. In the morning they arose early and exchanged oaths. Then Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. Do not allow verse 32 to escape your attention. Look what it says. Now it came about on the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug, and they said to him, We have found water! A bell that comes, and there's no well, there's no water there. Hey, let's make peace, okay? And then after all of that's done, God's like, boom! Gushing water. Don't you love how God works? What a confirmation to Isaac. This is where I want you, Isaac. So he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. I, I love what God does here. Affirming the blessing, affirming the promise to him over and over in numerous ways. Giving him peace in which the land that he sojourns in without any of it really truly being given to him. But he confirms everything with Isaac. There's a contrast in the section that concludes. Isaac following in the footsteps of his father. Not all good footsteps, but following in his footsteps. And those are good footsteps to follow in because Scripture praises it, the man Abraham. And Isaac is doing his best to, to trust God, to have faith in him, to listen to his instruction. And God is blessing him. Yet we come to the final verses of this chapter and there is a stark contrast with his son Esau. Look at what it says. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Bere, the Hittite, and Basma, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. This choice that their son makes no doubt trying to instill the things that God taught Abraham and that God is now teaching in Isaac's life, trying to pass those on. Yet each of us, once again, I restate, make our own choices. 
Esau was not ignorant of this God. Esau was not neglected in learning how to offer sacrifices, but we see his heart here, and it will go clearly into the next chapter as we look next week. But I want us to close and look at those two things. What is it that we learn? As we look at these passages, what is it that we learn? And first and foremost, church, God is faithful. You and I serve a faithful God. He is faithful to carry on the promises that he gave to Abraham. God does not negate on his word. And they are now being carried on the promise and blessing through his son Isaac. We learn that God is constantly active in our lives. Did you notice how many times in, in Isaac's life that God says, I will, I will, I will. He is working. And church, he wants to work in your life too. This is not a distant God that you and I serve. He is intimately involved. And God is the one that will bring these things about. We'll see it time and time again, what we can apply you and I serve the same faithful God. Don't forget it. The next time you turn on that negative news, don't forget we serve a faithful God. The next time you come to the scriptures and you're tempted to look just at the negative to build yourself up, look at God. Look at who we serve. Look at who we worship. And be in awe. Fall in love with him all over again. Let me encourage you, church. Regardless of how many children you have or don't have, grandparents, I, I'm talking to a church family right now. We need to invest to train, equip the next generation. They'll make their own choices, but we need to give them the best possibility, the, the greatest understanding of this God that we serve so they make good choices. And lastly, following God's not always easy. I know that's deep, right? But it is best. You and I will have opportunities to go through difficult times, famines, whatever it is. We'll be given the choice to make things a little easier and not follow him. Or follow him even though it's harder, and discover God's best for your life and mine. And as we do, we will learn of the faithfulness of this God that we serve and how much he desires to do this life with us. Let's close in prayer. God, we come before you. And God, sometimes our lives are, are just day in and day out. Sometimes they feel like a famine where we're walking in a desert. Other times, God, we see your hand of blessing and it's just, it, it's overwhelming. God, I pray that regardless of what it is, that you will find us to faithfully follow you. God, when people look at our lives, our response to our circumstances around us, I pray, Lord, that it would just bring glory and honor to you. It would point people to go, wow, what a God they serve. So, Lord, we, we ask that we would be willing vessels to be used by you. God, thank you for a life like Isaac. Not a perfect life. 
one that we can find faults with, the God we can look in the mirror and find faults to. May we look at the things in your word and find where we can bring you glory and honor in our lives. We ask for your help in this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God for his faithfulness. Amen. 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 In response to that faithfulness, we're going to sing a closing hymn. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. One of the definitions for the word consecrated is to devote ourselves irreverently to the worship of God. I hope we can do that today as we sing in response to his faithfulness. Join me as we sing. Let's stand. Take my life and let it be. could be true in each of our lives. Lord, that we would take our lives in response to your faithfulness. Lord, consecrate ourselves to you in daily worship so that we can bring others to yourself, Father. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope you can stay for the fellowship time in a few minutes.